After the sermon, we'll sing from Psalter 125, verses 1 through 5. Well, congregation, brothers and sisters, in around 1000 AD, about 180 years after the death of Charlemagne, king of the Franks, the then Emperor Otto, he ordered that his tomb be opened up. And he went inside to see how they had buried this great and powerful king. And when he did so, he was amazed by what he saw. You see, in that great tomb, Charlemagne had been buried with all of his earthly treasures, all of his vast riches and possessions. But then he saw the remains of the king himself, the skeletal figure of Charlemagne sitting upright on his great royal throne with his regal crown still sitting upon his brow. But to his astonishment, he discovered that on his lap was a copy of the Gospels, and his bony finger was resting in the words of Mark chapter 8 and verses 36 and 37, where Jesus said, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul. And it would seem then that Charlemagne, though he was a great king and ruler, he realized that in the end, all of his greatness, all of his achievements, his vast amount of wealth, at the end of the day, none of it really mattered. You see, when it came for him to die, he had to leave it all behind all of his fine robes, all of his riches, his titles, his royal standing. Couldn't take any of it with him when he went out into eternity to meet his God. And you see, friends, that is the solemn fact that confronts us in this passage before us in Mark chapter 8, which we read earlier, that whenever we reach the end of life's journey, Nothing we have achieved or accumulated in this life. None of it will ultimately really matter. You see, all that will matter in that moment is our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this afternoon then I want to think about this passage of Scripture, these two great questions that Jesus addresses to every one of us here in Mark chapter 8 and verses 36 and 37. And as we reflect on these questions, I want to consider three things that they press upon our minds. Firstly, they focus our minds on the worth of the soul. Secondly, they force us to think about the waste of a soul. And then finally, they call us to think seriously about the well-being of our soul. So firstly, the worth of the soul, then secondly, the waste of a soul, and then finally, the well-being of our souls. Well, let us begin to think about these two great questions here in Mark chapter 8 then by focusing our minds on this question, this matter of the worth of the soul. And friends, what is the worth of the soul? What is the worth of your soul and mine? Well, Jesus infers here in these verses, the soul is of infinite worth. It is worth more than this whole wide world, everything that it contains, all of the cities and nations and continents of this world, all of its silver and its gold, all of the rubies and diamonds and precious stones that it contains, all of the stocks and shares and bonds and wealth of this world, all of the vast resources of this world, all of it, Jesus is saying our souls are of more value than all of these things put together. And why is it that Jesus says that? Well, friends, it's because the Bible teaches that you and I, we are a soul. We are an immortal soul. You see, when God created man in his own image and likeness, he formed him of the dust of the ground. He breathed into his nostrils 
the breath of life, and he became a living soul. And you and I, friend, we're not simply a body then. We are not simply the sum of our biological parts. You and I are each a soul inhabiting a body. That's why Paul speaks, you'll remember, about the body in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. He describes it as our earthly house. Because you see, the body is the place where the soul currently lives. And our present bodies, they will perish then. These same bodies that we, we spend so much time looking after, feeding and clothing and washing and pampering and, uh, and worrying about. They'll one day be laid in a grave when we will draw our last breath. But you see, our souls will live on. They will go on existing forever and ever. They will continue ex to exist when the sun, the moon, the stars, and, and all of the planets, everything else in the created order will have disappeared. Because you see, the soul is that part of us that was made in the image and the likeness of God. And it can no more cease to exist then than God himself can cease to exist. And friends, our souls will go on enduring in existence then throughout all eternity, world without end. And they will continue to exist forever as the Bible teaches in one of two places either in heaven or in hell. And you see, that is why Jesus is stressing here the infinite worth and value of the soul in comparison to all other created things because he wants us to take to heart just how precious and immeasurably valuable our souls truly are to recognize they are the most valuable possession that has or ever will be entrusted to us by God. And you see, friends, that realization is meant to put life into a totally different perspective then. You see, unlike the misguided atheist who alleges that we are simply the byproduct of blind, mindless, purposeless, naturalist, natural processes, would have us believe that you and I were nothing more than a physical mass of molecules. We are the accidental product of a combination of chemicals that have highly evolved. Unlike the misguided atheist who says these things, you and I, we are meant to see ourselves as God sees us. We're meant to see ourselves as we truly are, not as an accidental collocation of, of atoms and molecules, but as creatures who are made in the image and likeness of God, and therefore as beings who are intrinsically immortal and eternal by creation, beings who will never, never, ever, ever cease to exist. And friends, do we see then why this question of the soul's worth is of such great consequence? Do you see why it is that Jesus impresses these questions upon us here in, the, in, in our text? What will it profit a man or a woman or a boy or a girl if they gain the whole world and yet they lose their soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul. You see, what the Lord Jesus is basically placing before us here is a pair of scales. And on the one side of the balances, he is placing the whole world and everything in it. And then on the other side, he is putting one single soul. And he is telling us the value of that one soul it outweighs all the rest. And friends, we are called by Jesus then to use our own minds to place our own souls on that same scale and to weigh their worth in the balances, in the light of eternity, in light of their immortality, in light of the fact that they are destined to exist forever, either in heaven 
or in hell, in conscious bliss or in conscious torment. And you see, we're to let the, salt, the weight of the solemn reality of the impending death of our bodies, the immortality of our souls and our eternal destinies, to lead us to view life and this world around to say to ourselves as we awake each morning in the language of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that the time is short, the form of this world, it is passing away. And thus it is our wisdom to use this world as not misusing it, by not wasting our souls in the pursuit of this world, the vanity of those things, that are all around us, that are destined to perish with use. And that brings us to consider in the second place then, these questions, they force us to think about the ways of a soul, that it is very possible, as Jesus reminds us here, to waste our souls by losing them, by trading or exchanging them for the things of this world. And you see, friends, our souls are in grave danger then of being wasted and squandered according to Jesus. Because you see, we can waste them and lose them by simply wasting our lives. You see, the original Greek word for soul that is used here in the the text, it's the word suke, which also means life. And so whenever the Bible speaks of our souls, it's also referring to our life our inner life or the life of our souls, the life that is expressed through our physical bodies. And another way of phrasing what Jesus is asking here then would be, what can you give in exchange for your life? Or even what can you give in exchange for yourself? You see, our soul is the true essence of our life. And our being, as we've said, it is the real us, so to speak. It's that dimension of our lives which will transcend the bounds of of this earth and our earthly existence here that will never cease to exist. But friends, we need to remember it is also the control center of our being while we are here in time. It's that which animates us and directs us in our physical earthly existence. And our souls are our lives then. They can be oriented toward God or they can be oriented toward material or earthly things. And of course, the soul was made to be oriented and directed to, toward God so that we would live for Him in our physical bodies. We would make His will and purposes the guiding principle of our lives here on earth. But you see, we need to understand if that is not how we choose to live, if instead we are simply turned in on ourselves, we use the capacities and energies of our souls to pursue our own ends and goals in life, then we will lose our souls or our lives. Because as Jesus says in verse 35, the person who saves his life person who chooses to channel the energy and capacities of their souls toward themselves, their own ends and desires in life, they will lose their lives. They will never know or experience the true meaning of life, either in this life or in the life that is to come, which is to know the life of God in the soul as we give our souls over to him to become his dwelling place. And Jesus is saying then the way to lose our souls or our lives is by living a self-centered life, a life that is turned in on ourselves, that doesn't have God as its central reference point. And of course, you see, when God is not at the heart and center of our lives, then inevitably we are. And you see, when that is the case, what will we live in pursuit of? We won't live in pursuit of God, but of everything that this world appears to have to offer to us. And thus we will waste our souls, our lives then, by living only for ourselves, for our own priorities rather than God's priorities. 
And by giving ourselves then to attaining and to holding on to earthly material things rather than focusing on God and spiritual things. As though Jesus had it wrong when he said elsewhere in Luke chapter 12 and verse 15, one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. And how many people today are wasting their lives then? They are forfeiting the well-being of their souls by thinking their lives do consist in the acquisition of things. And so they give themselves over entirely to the pursuit of worldly and material gain and what they can get out of this world as though these things can and will satisfy the longings and desires of their souls and make them truly happy. And all the while, they're keeping God off the throne of their souls, out of their hearts and lives, because they have chosen to save their lives for themselves and their own ends. And the tragedy is they don't realize that in doing so, they are losing their lives. They are destroying their souls. You see, friends, our souls were made by God for himself to live in relationship to him as their true owner. And no matter how much of this world you and I might gain then, it can never bring real satisfaction into our lives if we aren't rightly related to God in our souls. Because as we sing in the words of Psalm 203, to live apart from God is death. And a life that is lived in the interests of self and worldly gain, it is a wasted life then because it's a life that actually separates us from God and from the life of God, from the enjoyment of God. You see, a preoccupation with self is the very thing that shuts God out from the soul, keeps him from occupying his rightful place in our hearts and lives. That's why, as one man has said so well, there is no life so empty as a self-centered life, but there is no life so centered as a self-emptied life. And friends, to be truly rich then in life, it's not to be rich in what this world can give us. It is to be rich toward God, to have Him as the eternal portion of our souls. Reminds me of the very wealthy man I read of. He owned a tremendous amount of land. He was talking to his Christian neighbor one day was bragging to him about all that he had, all that he owned. And he and his neighbor, they were standing out in the middle of one of his fields. The man, he said very boastfully to his, his neighbor, he said to him, look over that way, as far as you can see, everything you can see, I own it. Then he said, look over that way, as far as you can see. Everything you can see, it's all mine. I own it all. Then he said to him, look in that direction, as far as you can see. Everything you see, I own it. Then he finally said to him, look in that direction, as far as you can see. Everything you can see, I own it. It's all mine. And his Christian neighbor standing beside him said to him, he said, that's wonderful. You own everything in all four directions. I'm happy for you. But then he said to him, let me ask you a question. How much do you own in that direction? And his neighbor bowed his head at that point because you see, he knew he wasn't rich toward God. He wasn't right with God in his heart and in his life. And you see how many are just like that man. They are taken up with this world and what they have in it. And they judge their success by what they have 
And all the while they forget that true riches, they are not bound down with material possessions and the stuff of this world. You see, all of these things, friends, they will pass away. We'll have to leave them all behind. And at best, we can only enjoy them then for a few short years. And you see, that's why the Lord Jesus warns us here against trading our souls for earthly gain. That's why he instructs us in John chapter 6 not to labor and toil for that which perishes, but for that which endures to everlasting life that which he alone can give us. And friends, not, let us not be like so many around us then. Let us not be intoxicated with this world and all of the trifling, fleeting vanity that this world has to offer us. And let us not be like the world then, who as the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 55, are spending their money, their time, their energy, their wages for that which does not satisfy, which cannot satisfy. But friends, let us listen carefully to God. Let us eat that which is good. Let us delight our souls in true abundance. Let us incline our ears and come to Him and hear his words of counsel to us that our souls might live. You see, God doesn't want any one of us to lose our souls, to, to waste our lives in the pursuit of this world and material things. That's why he sent his own son into this world that we, we might have life in him, abundant life, real life, spiritual life, everlasting life, that it might be well through him with our souls. And that's what I want to move on to consider in the last place then. These questions of the Lord Jesus here, they call upon all of us to think seriously about the well-being of our souls. You see, as Jesus makes clear here in verse 35, the way to secure or save the well-being of our immortal souls is by losing them for his sake and the gospels, by giving them away to him to whom they belong in the first place, so that he might sit as king upon the throne of our hearts. He might reign supreme over our lives to direct them for his own ends and purposes and to reveal the life of God to us and within us. You see, friends, we must be prepared to lose our lives in order to gain life in Christ. You and I, we must be emptied of self before we can be filled with Christ. And when we come to Christ, then we're not only embracing the resources that he provides. We're not coming to him simply to embrace the gifts that he provides as blessings and benefits Christians. We are coming to him. We're bringing ourselves to him. We're placing ourselves under his sovereign lordship. And we are saying to him, you are now the Lord of my life. You're in charge of my life. Your will, your desire." your plans, your purposes. That's what I now want in my life. And boys and girls, I'm sure you've all heard someone say before when they have found something that someone else has lost. Finders, keepers, losers, weepers. And of course, they say that to try to cover up the fact that they know that the item they found, it doesn't truly belong to them, to grant themselves the right to, to keep it. And of course, they may well get away with, with keeping it. But you see, what Jesus is saying here in a spiritual sense is that it's not the finders who are keepers and the losers who are weepers. Rather, it is the losers who are the keepers. 
Because you see, those who are prepared to lose their lives by saying to God and Jesus, I give my life over to you, they are the ones who will actually find their lives and keep them. By those who try to keep their lives by saying to God and Jesus, stay out of my life, they're the ones who will lose their lives. You see, whatever they may appear to gain in life by ignoring God, going their own way in disregard of his will and his, his purposes, will ultimately be lost to them. And the loss will be utterly devastating for them. Because you see, they will discover they have forfeited their own souls. And God will say to them at the last, on that awful solemn day, the day of the judgment then, the day that Jesus speaks about here in verse 38, when he will come again in the glory of his Father with the holy angels to judge the world in righteousness, he will say to them on that day, depart from me, ye cursing, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. As Matthew informs us in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 41. Because you see, as he says here, all those who are ashamed of the Lord Jesus and of his words in life, all those who will not identify with him, will not follow him in this adulterous and sin sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed on the day of judgment, and they will have no lot or portion with them then, but they will go to a lost eternity in hell. And you see, it makes no difference what a person may have in life then if they don't know and acknowledge the Lord Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior then like the rich young ruler, they will lack the one thing truly needful. You see, like him, they will discover in the end that everything without Jesus equals nothing. But nothing plus Jesus equals everything. And to be without Jesus then, it will mean the eternal loss of the soul of the person who would not come to him and come after him by denying themselves and taking up their cross and following him. And friend, if you're here, you still haven't come to Jesus that you might have lied. You're still determined to go your own way in life rather than deny yourself, rather than follow him then I plead with you this afternoon for the sake of your immortal soul. Will you not do so today? Will you not join the ranks of those who have turned their life over to Christ? For my dear friend, what will it profit you should you gain the whole world and yet you lose your own soul? What will you give in exchange for your soul. Well, friend, what in life is worth the exchange of your immortal soul for a lost eternity? What will you be able to exchange for it in hell if you do go there? Nothing. Because it will be too late to do anything about your lost condition then. You see, the only thing that can save your soul, that can keep it out of hell and get it into heaven, is the perfect righteousness of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But if you won't give your soul to him while it is still the day of salvation to save you, you will not have him to reign over you in this life, then you cannot be saved. And you will never come into possession of that righteousness then. And friend, you will be without excuse on the day of judgment if that is your choice. And I realize some of you may find it hard to hear these things. 
But I trust you realize I don't say these things to you to be harsh or to be unkind. But I say them because I'm called as a faithful servant and ambassador of Jesus Christ to do so out of love for your immortal soul. Because I don't wish anyone here or anywhere else to go to a lost eternity when Jesus is passing you by in the gospel, when he is calling you to come to him as your Lord and Savior, that you might have life in him, life in all of its glorious and wonderful fullness. And friend, if you are still outside of Christ, will you not come to him then? Will you not embrace him as your Lord and your Savior this afternoon so that you might be saved? Will you not trade your love of this world, all of the, the things that are presently captivating your heart, will you not trade them in for a permanent eternal relationship with Jesus Christ? For my dear friend, I assure you today, if you will do so, you will never regret it, for you will find him as I and many others have, to be a faithful and a loving friend, a friend like no other, who sticks closer than a brother, who loves at all times, and you will discover he is the best of all possible masters. You see, his yoke is easy, as he said. His burden is light. When we place ourselves under his yoke, when we don't try to pull away from it, he carries the weight of the load for us as we walk in step with him, alongside of him. Because you see, he has a heart of compassion, heart of love for the very worst of sinners who will but come to him as their Lord and their Savior. And friend, come to him today then. Come to him without delay. For all those who come to him, he will by no means cast out. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul, or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Amen.